Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the DECA Eloquence box containing the complete America, American DECA excuse me, recordings of pianistic marvel Ruth Slenczynska. Yes, Ruth Slenczynska. Now, this was reviewed by Jed Disler at ClassicsToday.com. If you are a ClassicsToday.com insider, then I suggest you have a look at that review, the link to which is at the bottom of this video, because you can read Jed's appraisal and also listen to some sound clips. You know, I, I was going to do this because, first of all, Slenczynska is a wonderful, wonderful pianist, but more importantly, she is still with us. She is 97 years old, or she's going to be, and on March 18th, 2022, she is going to release her latest album for DECA. She's got a new recording contract, and that is extraordinary. For those of you who don't know who she was, her life story is so remarkable. I mean, you can't really talk about her without talking about the biographical element. And I have to confess, I hate doing that because the only thing that really matters is the music. I mean, really, I, we shouldn't care. And she is a fine musician. But when you have a, a, I mean, she made this recording when she was 95 or so, or when she signed the contract when she was 95, I don't know the exact details, but she's teaching. She, she's a, been a faculty member at the, the University of Southern Illinois, or I believe it's Southern Illinois State, or one of those colleges, for like a zillion years. She's written books on piano, piano pedagogy. She's really a, a remarkable, remarkable person. But what makes it so fascinating is that she was one of the most promoted and abused child prodigies in the history of the arts. Really a horrifying story. She was born in Sacramento in 1925 to a Polish father, and he basically decided that she was going to be a pianist, no matter what. She was sort of like the Tiger Woods of the piano world. You know, Tiger Woods, his father, basically, since he was, you know, was like this big, made him play golf for his whole life. Of course, Tiger Woods apparently enjoyed it somewhat. Um, and she enjoyed playing the piano somewhat. She obviously had a gift for it. But she makes the point very forcefully that she was never a child prodigy. She was sold and marketed as a child prodigy. She gave her first recital at the age of five. You know, I mean, the booklet is really fairly an exceptional booklet in here, by the way, that tells her whole story. It's worth having just to read the booklet. I mean, it's an unbelievable story. And they've got photos of her. Um, you know, and it's really unbelievable. I mean, here's her farewell recital when she was five years old. And, and you know, here she is. Oh, is this the one? Yes. <clears throat> She's performing with the Paris Philharmonic under Alfred Cortot. There she is. Look at that. I mean, it's really, I mean, her feet couldn't even reach the pedals. You know, it's that, it's that crazy. You know, she studied with, with Rachmaninoff and Hoffman and Petri and Arthur Schnabel and Alfred Cortot. But what we didn't know is that her father was an absolute monster who, from the age of three, um, you know, forced her to practice for nine hours a day, um, seven days a week, and beat the living crap out of her. Um, whenever she disobeyed him or didn't achieve the goals that he set for her. She had those unbelievable mentors, a list of genius pianists, but she was entirely, entirely forced to do whatever her father told her he had to do, musically as well as in terms of her career. She had no life, and she was severely beaten regularly. And it's just an awful story. What's amazing is that she had the fortitude to get away from him. At the age of 15, she said, screw this. She gave up her performing career. She went to college. She went to UC Berkeley. Um, and she stopped playing and began to have a life. But then about 10 years later, she started to rebuild her career as she rebuilt her life as an independent human being. Her father died in 1951. And then in the late 50s, a few years later, in the process of putting her career back back on, on track, because in the, in, the, in the 30s, she was a marvel. I mean, she was really a, a household word. She was billed as the greatest prodigy since Mozart. I mean, the way she was marketed. 
um, she signed a contract with American Decca and she made 10 albums, which are in this, which for some reason American Decca's DG, I mean, I don't know how that works, but it, it's, they're in this box. And she's made some other recordings in, in the meantime. If you know Ivory Classics, you know Earl Wilde's, Earl Wilde's album, there are, there are three, three, at least three discs of her in that catalog. I'm including uh, Schumann's Carnival and some other things, which which we reviewed also at Classics Today, and and she's she's very highly regarded in the Far East, where there are live recordings of her concerts in in Japan and some other places. I mean, she has a reputation among pianophiles, um, especially for her pedigree, which was just unbelievable. I mean, really unbelievable. But her career has been unbelievable. And she's still in very good shape at the age of 97. And now she has a recording contract. I only hope, I only hope that if this disc that's coming turns out to be really good, um, that she gets to do more, you know, while she can. Um, that's, that's always the, the issue, isn't it? Um, and uh, it's just, it's an unbelievable story. And we have to tell the story. I mean, it is, it is part of the, the package that you get when you listen to, to Ruth Slinchinska. And so let's just talk about what's in here. Um, I am not going to try and second guess Jed. I think what he said to say about this set, which he gave, I think, an eight out of 10, is, is entirely, entirely correct and, and sensitive and sensible. So, uh, you know, I'll just go through the contents of this, and then you can make up your minds what you'd like to do. I think she's a wonderful artist who's well worth knowing. I'm going to try and describe her her particular sound, because she has one. Um, she really does. I mean, she's, a, she's a personality, as you might imagine, having, you know, just from the biographical details. I mean, she has strength of personality and character and a real point of view. So, um, most of this box is concerned with her Chopin. You get the Etudes Opus 10 and Opus 25, which I think are extremely well done. One of the things you notice about her right away is that she has a very, a very personal rubato and a very strong rhythmic sense underpinning the music. Um, I, I really like that, particularly in Chopin. You know, there's so much Chopin that can sort of swim all over the place. But hers, hers does not. Hers never loses sense of the basic pulse. You may disagree with what the basic pulse is. That's always possible. But it's there. And for that reason, sometimes I think her interpretations can come off as a little bit foursquare. You know, because she's always maintaining a certain, you know, structural rhythm, shall we call it. Um, in the scherzi, you get the four scherzi here. Um, that does not work as well as it does elsewhere in some of the shorter works. I think in the larger works they require a little bit more, a little bit more sort of large scale, large scale planning, than um, she seems to she seems to want to do at least in these performances. But uh, you know, there's nothing here that's less than good. It's all a I mean, it's Chopin. Everyone in, the, in their mother has recorded it, and you know, it's almost impossible to talk of, you know absolutely the best this or the best that when it comes to Chopin because there's so many different performances by so many great artists and so you know it's all just a question of your taste but we get the etudes and the impromptus one and two are with opus 10 and impromptus three and four are with opus 25 those are lovely performances then you get the scherzi which like i said um you know jed felt were a little bit a little bit wanting in their structural grasp but i agree with that especially the, the middle sections tend to sag a bit, but that's okay. And then you get the waltzes, um, some of which are better than others, you know, as you might expect, but they're well done. And the 24 preludes and the Polonaise Opus 53, which I think is the A-flat Polonaise. Boy, is that good. And the preludes are wonderful. I love this performance of the preludes. The one that I, I always... For some reason, I love Chopin in A flat. You know, I always go for the A flat prelude just to see what's going to happen. Um, you know, it's, that's the number seventeen, and it, you know, it's the one that goes da 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 da. You know that, but it's 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 all based. I mean, I've played that prelude, believe it or not, horribly. But it's it's all based on this underlying pulse. And the melody arises out of that rhythm. And the key, of course, is 
is to is to project the melody as an independent entity while not losing sight of the rhythm and how the hands coordinate and all that and i love this performance i really do because it just has this wonderful effortless fluidity to it it's beautifully done it's beautifully weighted you know with the, the bass notes come in at the end with the tune on the top and it's, it's, it's gorgeously done and all of the preludes i think are really pretty spectacular it's a wonderful performance of the preludes um and then we have the ballads um and which do go come off better than the scherzi i think i really do i think they're 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 more effectively shaped and and uh, again, I, I just like the steadiness of rhythm. You know, Chopin is such a you know, mess of, of, of push me, pull you stuff with some pianists, but not here. And I enjoyed that. But then she does her, her uh, list arrangements of these six Polish songs. And her list is fabulous. Everybody thought so. She is a great, great list pianist. I only hope at 97 she gets a chance to make a couple list discs, you know, because boy, could she play list. She just gets it. There's no, you know, sort of virtuosity for its own sake. Everything has shape. Everything is beautifully sung. She just does it wonderfully. And she knits it all together again because of that that underlying sense of rhythm that she has that just keeps these pieces from falling apart or becoming selections of episodes with no with no relation to each other so it, for the list stuff she does the rhapsody espanol a piece which can be as shapeless as a you know, jello and this is possibly the best performance of it i've ever heard and fufole um, and the six grand Paganini etudes, which is just marvelous. Then there are two recital discs, her 25th anniversary program, um, which, you know, she made when she was like 30, um, which has music by Bach, Chopin, Mendelssohn, Rachmaninoff, Scarlatti, Bartok, Schumann, Debussy, and again, Liszt. And these are, again, really fine performances, wonderful performances. And then some encores. Bach, Mendelssohn, Schubert, Prokofiev, Liszt, Rachmaninoff, Mussorgsky, Schumann, Debussy, Villa Lobos, and Chopin. I love these, these. I mean, these are those, you know, you put them all on and listen to the whole album, and it's just so wonderful. Beautiful programming, wonderful performances, and delightful. And then two concerti. The Liszt Concerto Number 1, which these are done with, um, one is with the Vienna Symphony, and one is with the Symphony of the Air. And again, the Liszt Concerto Number no. One is as cogent and, and glittering a performance of the Liszt First Concerto as you will ever hear. And the Saint Saint Second is also fabulous, absolutely fabulous. I particularly like the 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 way that she builds the work from movement to movement. You know, the central scherzo is usually played as a scramble. She doesn't scramble. It has elegance. It has poise. It has. It has, it's just, it's wonderfully smiling. It has insouciance, you know, it's insouciant. That's the word for it. And the finale is, is really fast and dazzling, absolutely dazzling. So she is a major pianist. There's no question about it. And she's been hidden from view, you know, surfacing every now and then, like sort of like Brigadoon. You know, every hundred years she pops up and there she is. You know, just as she was before. It's kind of an amazing story when you think about it. It really, really is. So I, I recommend I recommend that you listen to her, that you get to know her, um, get to know Ruth Slanchinska. She knows what she's doing. She is one of the great 20th century stories, and 21st century, 22nd century. What are we in now? I don't know. Whatever century we're in, 23rd century, she's, she's, she's one, of the, one of the great stories. Um, of the 21st century. That's the one we're in, I think. And, and uh, she's, she's, she's a phenomenon. She may not have been the greatest prodigy since Mozart. She may not have been a prodigy at all, but she's a phenomenon and a musician down to her fingertips. And I don't want to hear anyone say, well, I guess it was okay what her father did to her because she wouldn't have had her career unless that had happened. Um, she's made lemonade out of lemons. That's the bottom line. And she deserves full credit for that as well. So keep on listening, folks. Um, get ready for the new release 
um, at the age of 95 or 96 or something like that from Ruth Sluchiska. Not since, since, since Horshovsky have we had piano records from pianists of that, of that pedigree and that age. It's quite extraordinary, isn't it? It really is. So I'm looking forward to it, and I'm sure you will be too. And in the meantime, we have these 10 fine discs to get to know her. And I think you should. I really do. Keep on listening, folks. Thanks for joining me. Take care.